Okay, great. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm the head of the LS LSST's Education and Public Outreach subsystem. Um, and I'd also like to invite on the call today uh, is the deputy, newly promoted um, deputy of EPO, Lauren Corlees, who has uh, an astronomy background. She's been with us since October. Um, and a lot of the things we'll, I'll discuss today or the, the asks that I have of science collaborations will be largely um, interacting with her and based on some of the work that she's done. So uh, Lauren, if you wanna flash your, your video so people can see your little face in the bottom, hopefully. Hello. <laughs> I don't know if that worked or not, if people can see me. <laughs> Hello, Lauren. Yes, we can. Hi, great. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks for joining, Lauren. It's eight o'clock is early. Um, okay, so uh, today I want to give you kind of an overview of what the EPO program is, specifically who our audiences are, what the deliverables we are building for those audiences, the um, development work we've done up to this point in our construction period, some of the successes we've had, um, show some of that stuff off, and then I'll move into some of the opportunities for the science collaboration to get involved during the construction project um, and some of the, the things that we're actually in need of right now, some kind of expert assistance. So I'll, I'll ask for some of that. Um, and then talk about some of the future work, where we're going over the next year or so, and then I'll also talk about the Project and Community Workshop and what you can expect from EPO there. Um, I think since this is recording, uh, if you have quick questions throughout, then feel free to ask those, but maybe we can save questions to the end just so if somebody wants to just listen to the presentation, they don't also have to listen to all those questions. Now, I want to clarify something that seems to be a confusion a lingering confusion for this project, because it's a bit unique among other astronomy and, and large physics projects, in that um, education and public outreach is part of the construction project, which is great. That's uh, not a very common thing among ground-based astronomy projects. But the distinction is that we are separate from communications inside of the construction project. So anything that you receive from the project right now, the digest, email, social media, the maintenance of the website, the design of the website, all of that is run through the project communications office, which is um, the project manager is Rand Powell Gill, uh, and that's out of the project, uh, out of the director's office. So what my role is, is to build the EPO um, program that will launch once we go into operations. So my construction funding funds me to build that program, not to actually do outreach or do communications right now. We will ultimately, in the pre-operations phase, come together so that when we are in operations, both communications and EPO are together under the same umbrella, but for now, um, we're separate. And so later on in the talk, I'll talk a little bit about um, what you can do now to kind of have communications promotion of any work that you might want to get uh, publicized. Um, versus what might what that might look like during or during operations. Um, okay, so that's it's just a little bit different than what most people are used to. So I'm not the one that sends you those emails. That's right, pal. <laughs> and if you send a message to communications desk team at lsst.org, then you, it goes to the communications team to, to deal with. Okay, so back to EPO itself. Our mission is to offer accessible and engaging online experiences that provide non-specialists access to and context for LSST data so that anyone can explore the universe and be part of the discovery process. We are specifically emphasizing the online experience aspect of the programs that we're developing um, for a couple reasons. Part of that is because within the Aura framework of the other astronomy organizations that do offer EPO, so Gemini, NOAO, uh, most of the things that they offer are very um, hands-on. They go to classrooms or they do things in person, and I think that's great and very valuable. But I also think that LSST offers something completely different in the way that it's serving its data to the community. We can take advantage of some of the modern web frameworks to deliver this data in accessible, interactive, web-based ways that are mobile-friendly, um, that teachers can use in their classroom without having to download uh, any sort of software or data. And so I think what we're offering in this online sense is really trying to move into what the web offers, the potential of what it can do and what a fully fledged EPO team can provide in terms of um, 
interactive, intuitive interfaces. So I'll, I'll describe uh, that a little bit more, but just to point out that we're kind of unique in compared to what other EPO programs are offering. <clears throat> so we have chosen four main audiences that we are um, reaching out to, that we are engaging with in the products that we build. One is citizen science principal investigators. So specifically, the I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the specifics. Um, formal educators, so teachers um, who might bring these activities into their classroom. Science centers, planetariums, um, people who get something like two million visitors a year that go through their doors to learn about astronomy and science. Um, and then science interested general public. <laughs> <coughs> Some of the specific deliverables that we are offering those audiences. Um, for citizen science principal investigators, we are building the infrastructure for any scientist to initiate a citizen science project using LSST data. And that happens through the science platform to take data over into the Zooniverse, is who we've partnered with for this um, project builder. So part of our construction project is building that infrastructure and delivering that. Um, dealing with all the data rights issues that come along with that, uh, promoting the citizen science projects, offering um, templates for design if people want to use that and kind of fit within the LSST branding, um, and then also support materials to help PIs understand what are the best practices for um, engaging with the citizen scientists who are participating in your project. How do you get the most out of it from um, the results perspective from your audience? Uh, for formal educators, we are developing a suite of online investigations that are available through our website. They um, are completely interactive. They are based on LSST data. As soon as LSST data comes along, in the meantime, we're using precursor data, <laughs> which I'll get into. Um, those all have support materials, so professional development for teachers to be able to gain confidence to use them and to bring them into their classroom without having to have a professional astronomer there to kind of troubleshoot or introduce the concepts. For science centers, we have a whole range of multimedia assets that are in the full dome for, uh, format and that are freely available. They come with some support documentation um, that describe what's happening, some suggested things that they can say for moderation. Um, and then some alert stream highlights. For the science interested general public, there's quite a bit that fits under this um, umbrella. So in general, we'll be designing and hosting the operations website, which will be available in both English and Spanish. We'll do traditional media, so press releases and pretty pictures, but we'll also be uh, taking advantage of social media in the sense that most of the general public is not gonna find out about LSSTE through like visiting the website, they're not going to go and try to Google it for the most part. Mostly what they're going to do is see a link on social media and click that link maybe, or that'll take them somewhere. And then maybe they'll do something, they'll interact on the website with one of our activities, and then they'll be able to share that to their social media. And that would kind of promote things that way. So everything that we build will be with that in mind, mobile friendly, thinking about people on um, tablets, Chromebooks and classrooms. Um, and taking advantage of, of social media and how people are actually discovering things these days. And then interactive visualization tools, these include um, how we're going to present the alert stream to the public. How do we make that exciting? How do we let people know what the telescope is doing and what it's finding and how do they learn about more of the exciting research that, that LSST is producing? Um, and I think I haven't redesigned this. One of the previous criticisms I got about this graphic was that everything looks like it's completely separate and independent, which is not the case. <laughs> so to think about how to redesign that graphic. Um, any, almost anything that we build will be um, used in other areas. So our, our website will have a promotion of citizen science projects. It will show some of the latest videos. It will um, highlight some of the activities that we do with the formal educators and some of those interactive tools will be featured in other aspects for, you know, inside of a, a press release or a science story, we might use some of those interactive tools that we've built for other purposes. Okay, so I'll start going through um, some of these audiences and specifically what we've achieved up to this point, kind of what the design is, what we intend to build. So for citizen science, uh, we finished the first phase of development earlier this year, which was, yay, um, I was very excited to, to complete that. 
So we've worked with the Zooniverse, who's based in the UK, who's the most um, popular citizen science platform. Um, they've been around for about 10 years now, and they've got up to about 100 research papers published based on results from the citizen science projects that they've initiated. Um, so what we did was we worked with that team um, and data management to set up a workflow for how PIs initiate citizen science projects. So as a scientist, what you would do is you would go into the science platform, you would use the tools inside of the science platform to define the sample set that you would want to use as your, um, for your citizen science project. You would kind of cut out your thumbnail images if that's what you're using. And then, um, and then what you would do is there's going to be some kind of template Jupyter notebook probably that you would go in and you would say, this is my sample set. You would push that out into the cloud. The Zooniverse project builder would pull that over and then you'd log it into the project builder through an interface that kind of looks like this. You would uh, identify your sample set with a token or something like that. And then you'd follow this kind of like a WordPress form that they have developed to build your citizen science project. So you write your description, you've got your scientists, you um, show the images. Through this process, they give you a preview of what the website um, would look like for your project, and you get to kind of play with that, test it out. Um, there's an official like 40,000 person volunteer beta tester group within the Zooniverse, so um, we'll offer that opportunity for you to test projects with very eager citizen scientists so they can give you feedback like, like, like that doesn't make sense. What are we supposed to do? Oh, this is so fun. So I think um, that's part of the process of what we're offering here, and it's pretty simple. Um, so at the moment, what, what we finished in phase one was now the Zooniverse is ready to receive data. And so the next phase of work is actually going to be how do we get into the science platform and build the package that will be incorporated there to send data over. And so um, that's something that work that will be starting in fiscal year 21. Um, the other thing that we've completed already is Spanish language capability. When we did a lot of our user testing in Chile, um, user needs assessment, most people that we asked had never heard of citizen science, and a lot of that is because most projects are built in English. They don't have Spanish equivalents of it. So what we did was work with the Zooniverse to ensure that within their platform, there is a capability to translate projects from English to Spanish or write projects in Spanish or translate them to any language. Um, and so now what we can offer for our Chilean colleagues, for anyone, the ability to create citizen science projects with LSST data in any language, which is pretty spectacular, I think. I'm very excited about that. Um, okay, so and that kind of all fits under our um, umbrella of really wanting to make things that are as inclusive as possible and reach a broader range of people to engage with than typical, than you know, we kind of typically do within the astronomy EPO sector. So part of that is um, multiple language. Part of that is having web developers on our team who can think about, say, the, the heaviness of what we build. We can't send something out to a school that maybe they've got broadband internet, but you give them something and it just weighs it down and totally freezes the system. That's not going to work. And so thinking about how to make these activities responsive and not completely break the internet if the school has, you know, just kind of recently gotten it. So phase two is implementing this package in a science platform. Um, it's developing the templates for what your citizen science project can look like to fit under an LSST um, branding, if, if you so choose. Um, and then also we have to organize uh, what we're calling a citizen science data policy committee, um, which will probably be a subset of the LSST data policy committee, which will, um, when you submit a citizen science project, you'll also have to submit kind of a paragraph about what metadata is absolutely required for your project to be successful. And then it's likely that we would scrape the rest of the metadata off of there, because once the data goes into the citizen science realm, it's public. And so we just have to be protective, um, aware of the data rights issues. And we'll, we've thought through that process, we just kind of have to put it in place. Um, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm confident that will work. And then uh, we will be commissioning two citizen science projects in fiscal year 22 or 23, it kind of depends on what data becomes available from the commissioning process or simulated surveys, just to make sure that we are working with PIs um, on the full, like from start to finish, making sure everything makes sense, that all the documentation's there, that you know the pipelines work, um, and then actually run those projects and, and fully support those projects before we hit the first data release of LSST. And you know potentially over the 10 years, I would imagine we could have 100 or 200 projects specifically for LSST data. 
And I'll, I'll reflect that the second part of the decision of building this infrastructure as opposed to hosting one or two projects as an EPO team is that um, we're not the experts. You know, I do, I have an astronomy background, Lauren's an astronomer, those are the only two astronomers we've got on our team, but I didn't want to, you know, uh, try to feign a preference for one type of science over the other. And so this infrastructure really allows as many citizen science projects to be created and is a research tool for astronomers to get their research done with data sets as massive as LSST. Um, so that's all for citizen science. Maybe I'll pause and see if anybody has a quick question on that before I move on. So what is the timeline? Go ahead, Megan. Um, so a couple, couple questions, actually. One is some confusion over is who wants to do a citizen science project allowed to? Or is it just uh, a U.S. scientist? Anyone who has access to the science platform. But is that the U.S. science platform? Well, that there's, is... There will be different science platforms, right? Yeah. So that's a very good point. So in the um, reflecting on kind of the recent information we've had on data rights and <laughs> data access, um, I'd like to make it so that anyone who has data rights is able to start a citizen science project through this pipeline. Um, and we'll have to work out some of the details as the specifics of what data rights and data access look like uh, become more clear over the next couple of years. Oh, if somebody's talking, I can't hear you. Nope, still can't. Are you muted? What is the timeline? Where would you like to have input from us uh, start coming in? Yeah, that's great. So probably not on the timeline of this project and community workshop, but potentially next project and community workshop. Um, I think as Meg points out, some of the dust needs to settle and clear a little bit as far as data rights and access, what international DACs might look like. Um, and that's not our focus for the next year. So if people are thinking about it, then probably in another year, they can start to come to us and, um, and let us know what types of projects they might be thinking about. Um, and the other thing we'll ask is within the project builder tool, they already have a lot of um, tools for citizen science to use that you can choose from. So do you have an image? Do you want people to put a circle around things or put a line or are you just comparing things? If there are specific tools that do not currently exist that would be necessary for your project to be successful, then that's something that we'd like to hear maybe in the timeline of the next year so that we can try to implement as many of those as, as we can. Amanda, one more question for you. You talk mm -hmm. a lot about images, but say I want to do light curves. How's that going to work? Because that's going to require me to do some kind of plotting and create an image, but it's not necessarily running a cutout tool and sending it. So is that also going to be in the system or would I have to run through the you catalog, can... produce that myself and upload it? Yeah, so that would probably be something you're going to have to um, do on your own so that the light curve looks like what you want it to look like to present to people. Um, and then you would send that as the data set over to the project builder tool. So would that then have different decks? Uh, I'm sorry, say that, say that again, you cut out a little bit. Yeah, the, will that have different checks on um, how to, uh, like if I'm uploading that separately from LSST, how do you, how does that go through that review board? Yeah, metadata I mean, and things like that. Yep. So these are all the, the potential things to work out. You know, what if somebody's taking things from a broker and so they're not actually going through the science platform um, and they're going straight over there? That's a little bit simpler because it's already public if it's gone through those brokers. Um, but uh, all the detailed workflows for how we deal with data rights will be the things that we're, um, we're working through when we have a little bit more specific information about how data rights works. So great questions. I would say in the next year, like these are exactly the kinds of things that, that we'll be asking for input for, and then we'll be making sure that we can incorporate those workflows into our system. 
Uh, okay. In principle, so, uh, if I'm yeah. Sorry, in principle, maybe you can um, I can suggest that in principle, there's a lot of data that would be available through the alerts, so that then it would be um, accessible worldwide, including the likers, which you can easily derive from the alerts. So in principle, there is data that it, not just images. There is actually a lot more data that that can be accessed without. Um, any data rights constraints. Yeah, absolutely. And so when that brings up a point that we'll have to think about, which we don't have a solution for yet, is if people um, are trying to start LSST science projects, but not going through the, the science platform, so it doesn't trigger me knowing about it, how do we kind of vet those? How do we do, um, how do we identify official LSST supported projects versus not, or what's that kind of process look like? So I, I don't have the answer to that yet. These are all the kinds of things that we're thinking about that we'll be working through. Uh, okay, so we're at about halfway through the hour. I'll go ahead and move on. Um, so multimedia is something that we've been working on over the last year um, in particular. So far we've completed 16 short videos in planetary format. So you can see a little snapshot here of what that looks like on a flat screen, but you can imagine if you're sitting in a planetarium, it covers the entire 360 degree uh, field of view. What we have decided to do is not create a single, um, you know, 30 minute or 45 minute show that features LSST. Instead, we've created these snippets that are 60 seconds to two minutes. Um, and we provide visuals covering uh, 16 different science topics that would be relevant for um, LSST. So we look at um, asteroids, we look at near-Earth objects, we look at gravitational lensing, we look at galaxies, we look at all kinds of different things. Um, and we offer uh, a document to go along with it that kind of gives you the details and specifications. And then a suggested, like if you were a, a content creator at a planetarium, and you wanted to use one of these snippets for a show or to highlight some new thing that's coming out, you could download it for free and you could read what we suggest as words that you could write over, like the voiceover that you could give, which gives a description of what you're seeing, um, what it means, what the physics are, and then we kind of um, give a couple contacts within the LSST project that they could reach out to if they want more. So uh, we are producing these things in um, a consistent format that as many planetariums, big and small, can use. There's a, a Data to Dome initiative that, that discusses that. One of the challenges is different planetariums have different hardware and software, and so their vendors only allow them to download certain kind of formats or certain kind of things, and so this Data to Dome initiative um, allows as many different kinds of vendors to access these products as possible, so we're sort of opening that window for people. Um, these are available to use right now, um, and we're using them in terms of, of user testing. So if somebody has access to a planetarium and they want to use these for part of a public talk or a class, you're more than welcome to access them. Send me an email. Um, I'll ask you to fill out a little survey with it so that we understand how you're using it, why you're using it, what was successful, what could be improved, just so we have some understanding of, of how people might actually be using these and then what we can build in about two years from now when we have a little bit more funding dedicated to creating more. The other thing that I would like um, to ask assistance with is looking at the videos and looking at the documents that we've created that go with it. So it's kind of a, a two-page document per two-minute um, video. Just kind of fact-checking, just make sure, sure the story holds up. Um, our job is to make sure it makes sense to non-specialists, but your job is to make sure that um, that it's, it's accurate and it makes sense and it visually represents the kinds of physical phenomena to the best of our knowledge right now. So I'll, um, I plan on sending an email out to you and to the rest of the science collaboration chairs um, at some point this week and giving links to these things and asking for specific volunteers um, to identify people to go through this. I imagine this would be like maybe 15 minutes worth of work, um, but I really wanna get people familiar with what we're producing and kind of get people on board and reassure myself that we're producing things that are going to be valuable and accurate and um, and all of that. Uh, other things that we're doing, um, we're almost complete with this really fantastic uh, promo video. It's sort of like a like a cinema preview quality um, that I imagine we'll be able to use uh, when we do some big 
media splash like uh, renaming, for instance, or something like that. I don't know. We don't have an actual plan for it yet. Um, we have a digital asset management system to keep record of all of the things that are happening in the construction project. So videos and um, images, if people are visiting sites or they're doing or they're having collaboration meetings, take photos, send it to communications team. Um, and there's a member there who helps us upload these into our digital asset management system. And so we have them on record, we can use them, we can put them into videos, into other promo materials. So, so far this year, we've record, we've uploaded something like 6,000 media assets. So there's a lot there. It's quite a bit of work to make sure there's all the metadata and understanding where all the stuff is coming from and keeping it commented appropriately. Uh, you might have remembered if you went to the Project and Community Workshop last year, that there was the Storytime Domain um, interview booth. And we recorded about 20 different members of the project and community. Um, about six of them were in Spanish language. And so we've assembled that into a video for the Project and Community Workshop this year. So if you're attending, you'll be able to see it. And I'm sure it'll be on YouTube after that. Um, so that's another instance where we're trying to interview people and get a, a breadth of what people are doing for the project and what their, their roles are and where they're distributed. Um, and then we've also completed an initial prototype for an online 360 virtual de 360 degree virtual tour of the facility. So as you know, not very many people are ever going to go to LSST to use it. Um, and so this will be kind of an online opportunity for people to explore what the, the telescope looks like, what the view is, what the, um, the coding chamber, the auxiliary telescope, all of those things. So uh, we had it up online for a minute, but then we got um, uh, we got the no-no from our safety person because there's a couple images where people don't have safety hats on, so we weren't allowed to put it online. So we're, we're trying to update it, and you can see that. But uh, we'll uh, decide in another year if we actually want to contract um, somebody else to do that and kind of make it super fancy or if that's something that we can do in-house with our team. But I think that'll be a really fun um, aspect of what an interactive thing for our website will be. Uh, okay, I'll move on to formal education. Any quick questions on multimedia stuff? Yes, do you think, so will this uh, video, the multimedia asset, will it be available to us? Say that we organize the conference if we want to, or just even like a department meeting, and we want to showcase um, LSST as one of the assets of the research that our faculty is doing, something like that. Um, do we have the rights to show it? Do we have the rights to share it? Can we? actually put our hands on it if we have, say, a planetarium in our university? Yeah, so great question. If you do have a planetarium, again, feel free to reach out to me. These videos are available for use, but as in terms of user testing. So they're not available to share worldwide. I don't, I don't have them available publicly right now. Um, they will be, ultimately, probably when we move into pre-operations phase, so something like fiscal year 21 or um, getting into fiscal year 22, we'll have a whole suite of, of kind of promotional infographics and videos uh, that you'll be free to use. For now, it's sort of on a, a, a test request <laughs> only basis. Um, we are in the process of coming up with a complete inventory and making sure that all the documentation is there and we've got our understanding of our user testing and, and we'll start to slowly roll that out. But if you are giving a talk, you know, let us know. Um, the communications team also has a whole suite of materials from YouTube videos to um, kind of handouts, um, there's postcards, there's things like that. So that might be the first stop if you email communications team. Um, I see most of those emails, so if it's something specific for EPO, it'll come to me. So that would be the first place to request any kind of materials for your talks or promotional stuff. Okay, so formal education has been the focus of this year worth of development. Um, here you can see some screenshots of a particular activity called um, Coloring the Universe, and there's an English version and a Spanish version at this point. We've done some user testing in Chile with, at a summer school with the Spanish version. This one um, asks people to kind of go through and build a color image from individual filters and what that means in an earthly sense and then also for the, the astronomical image. So you can imagine assigning a color to different filters and then almost like in an Instagram slideable way you can adjust the intensity of the different colors and so we've got a suite of astronomical objects that students can choose from to build their own astronomical image and then share them if they want. 
uh, decide why they've made certain decisions about highlighting some aspects of the image versus others. So it really touches on giving people um, an intuition for why we make certain decisions in making color images as opposed to the uh, not too common, but definitely present. Oh, they're making up these images, they're false color. So trying to, to address that a little bit in an actual productive way. I've got a couple of shots of, we've had two groups of educators come to Tucson and we've sat down with them for a couple of days each just to really understand what they need in their classrooms and what, you know, we get, showed them a couple of prototypes, some of the, the full suite of what we would pr produce within a, an investigation and got some of their feedback. Um, so here's a couple other screenshots of development work. This one's looking at a density map of the Milky Way at the top left um, to try to identify where we live in the Milky Way and what the shape of the Milky Way is. The bottom is a very early prototype of a solar system. So you can imagine we'll do things with solar system objects, hazardous asteroids, uh, identifying what types of objects there are. Um, and then the one on the right is an interactive HR diagram where we introduce the idea of what does the sun look like, how big is it, how bright is it, compared to all of the other stars, and how do you determine that. So I'm not going to, I didn't show any live demos <laughs> or videos because I don't want to, you know, fall into that potential hazard, uh, but a lot of this stuff is starting to um, come up online and we'll be sharing those as they're um, available to play with and kind of show off. So um, LSST, we are creating these activities with the idea that middle school, high school, and college 101, so this isn't necessarily for astronomy majors, um, but College 101 can have these investigations. Each one will take about an hour or two, so within a classroom or for homework or within the lab, that a teacher can introduce without having to have an astronomer present in the classroom to do technology troubleshooting or answering the questions. So the teacher does not have to download software. They don't have to download the data. It's essentially they just go to a website, and each student has a website uh, that they can go to. We start with the main science themes of LSST and then take these activities through interactive widgets using LSST data to being relevant for the national, the next generation science standards, which are things that most states in the U.S. have to teach to. And there's also a national curriculum in Chile that we've tied these to. So there's some customization that teachers can do. Um, they're engaging, they're interesting, they're unlike anything else that exists right now online. Um, and so we kind of call this low stress technology from the, the teacher's perspective. So it's appealing for them to actually be able to use these and it's totally free. So these are the themes that we've identified, uh, the four LSST science themes, and then also we've called light and, and stars out because those are things that most um, introductory courses in high school are gonna have to teach to their students. Um, and then these are the, the titles, the working titles at the moment of the different investigations. Uh, that we're developing. So we're developing them right now. We start full user testing with educators um, and at National Science Teachers Association meetings next year. Then we start developing some professional development and getting teachers, I'm sure uh, we can ask many of you to test these out in your 101 classrooms to see how they work for you. Um, and then they should be ready to use once we go into operations. Uh, for your reading pleasure later, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a wordy slide, but these are all the investigations and the summary of the main activity of what the student is, is trying to get out of it, the learning outcome. And then more specifically for this, for you guys, um, I've done another table with the names of each activity and the data that we need. So ultimately we'll be creating um, pipelines to go straight from data products, from data releases, and user-generated products that we kind of work with people to understand what they're building and brokers. <clears throat> directly into populating these investigations. But in the meantime, we don't have LSST data and there's nothing that exists that's exactly like LSST as far as um, the resolution, the depth, the width, everything. So um, Lauren has been working incredibly hard to uh, come up with precursor data sets, get them into the format that the data products from LSST will come out as, um, and populate these activities. And so all of our user testing and probably when we are in early operations, we will have to be using this precursor data. But it, uh, astronomers are not very good at um, being consistent in how they present data. 
making it recreatable. And so it's it's been a struggle to to do this. So we've written up this table of the kinds of things that we need help with um, to populate these activities and really get them to the point where we can complete the development. Um, and I'm going to leave that with you guys. We are probably going to reach out. I'll again summarize this in an email later this week, but we'd really like to reach out to maybe a science collaboration chair who can identify somebody within their group who might be able to help with some of these specific tasks um, and help them not only um, populate our activities now, but understand what the science collaboration might be producing in its roadmap for what its user generated projects are going to be and can we work in a relationship to kind of have a, a pipeline that you know we receive that once you as a science collaboration create that type of data that would be ideal um, so okay i'll leave that there for now so to kind of summarize what i've i've had as asks for you all for how the science community can get involved with epo during construction um, so we need expert help in gathering some of this precursor data right now for educational investigations and maybe down the road for some other things. Um, we need volunteers to review these planetarium videos and the supplementary documents just for fact checking and um, knowledge that they exist, <laughs> what they are. Um, and then the other thing I want to highlight is that we are going to be offering small grants for astronomers, um, likely early career researchers, I'm imagining, but anybody can apply for it, to do to help us with setting up some of these pipelines for these data related tasks. So as I mentioned, we want to make sure that once data releases start coming out, there's a clear pipeline for it to start populating um, the activities that we have. So we do need some astronomy expertise. Um, we'll define small projects for maybe a solar system scientist or you know kind of specific areas of expertise will offer a stipend and travel to attend probably next year's or the year after that project and community workshop to report on the work and just to you know be there we'll do a little bit of science communication and epo training with uh, people who um, receive these and so we're working up the announcement for that so i would say look out for it around the time of the project and community workshop we might make an announcement there. Um, we'll announce online. I can send an email out to you guys. So if you know grad students or early postdocs or people who might be interested in this, it's not going to, I mean, the money will be offered for something over six months to a year, but it will be a, a relatively short amount of time that we estimate would be needed to, to invest in this. But it would be the opportunity for someone to get some financial support and recognition for doing educational work and get some some science communication training in that and then also build relationships with us for future work um let's see what's next oh i wanted to share this amazing photo if you hadn't seen it this is m1 m3 the primary tertiary mirror going up to the summit a couple months ago uh, and use that to talk about the upcoming work with epo so over our next fiscal year we will be um, Hiring a designer and a web developer will be working on the website architecture. So what does our education hub look like? Where are these, how does everything uh, live? And making sure that it's easily discoverable. Um, we're going to be doing branding work. Um, so there's this whole renaming business. That's a can of worms that I'm not going to open right now. But once it is a little more settled, uh, we're going to be working on the branding of, of LSST as a construction and operations project. Um, we'll be working with the current communications team on our operations strategy for communications and implementation plan. So um, this is the process of how do we vet as a project what um, press releases we're going to do? How do we build relationships with scientists to know what projects you're working on and um, suggest that maybe something could be a press release or you come to us and say, hey, I've got this great result coming up. I'm going to submit it. Um, I'd love assistance with making a big splash with this or kind of working on graphics or writing up the press release, what's the actual story, and then we help with that and also the advertising where you put it out on social media, help, helping to come up with the graphics or video that go along with it. So um, that's a pr and at the moment, you would reach out to communications team um, or you would reach out to your press officer at your university, and if something is going to come out, you reach out to the communications team at lsst.org so that they're aware and they can advertise it as well for you. But moving forward, that'll be a little bit more um, slightly different. Um, you'd probably reach out to a single contact and then the, the workflow after that might be a little different. And that's the thing that we're working on defining, um, especially in the sense that if many of you know, EPO or um, 
LSST in operations will be under the framework of ENCOA, which is supposed to be stood up at the end of this year. And so they also have a communications outreach and education group. Not sure what the word is to call it, matrix level. <laughs> <laughs> and so over the course of the next year, we'll be working with the new head of that group, Lars Christensen, on what the, how we can work together to kind of get maximal impact for any kind of um, press release or science result that we want to put out there. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is we're going to be working in the next year on bringing the alert stream to the public. So designing um, an interface where the public can kind of get the latest highlights of what's going on and maybe there's an interactive map and maybe it talks about what was the telescope looking at last night or what are the conditions on the summit. We are going to, um, Lauren is actually going to host a session at the Project and Community Workshop to brainstorm this, to kind of come at you with some of the ideas we've had um, and we'd love to hear what you guys think would be the most interesting things that the public would, would like to hear coming from your research areas or um, just about LSST in general. The feedback we've gotten from our user needs assessment is people want to, you know, they want to just kind of know what's going on. They want to keep up with LSST. They think it's a fascinating project, so they want to know what the most exciting things are. So how do we vet the most exciting things that are coming out from, say, the alert stream from, you know, variable stars to supernova to solar system objects? Like, how do we find out uh, over the course of a night, like, what are the three most exciting things? And so kind of getting your ideas on, on how that process should work or some things you think would be really great to highlight. And then we'll be continuing our work with the formal education investigation development and user testing. Um, so here's just an overview of what will be at the PCW. Um, our education specialist will be hosting a session on engaging students with LSST data. So you'll get a preview of all the investigations that are built out at this point. You can play with them, you can give feedback, you can let us know, um, you know, what you think and when, if you would be interested in, in testing some of them out for us. I'm going to do a session called Make Friends and Get Your Work Done, <laughs> which is uh, science communication, essentially. It's how do you communicate these complicated concepts that you're working on with people in an efficient and exciting way. How do you write better talks? How do you write better abstracts? How do you communicate things? Um, so that people understand them. That's really what we're, we want people to understand us. And so how do you, how do, you do that? <laughs> That's that session. Um, I mentioned the bringing the alert stream to the public session that Lauren will be hosting on Wednesday. And then we'll be doing lightning stories again. I host um, some number of project members to give a little five minute overview on their role within the project and something else about them. What's the most exciting thing about that? What, what are their hobbies? Uh, it's proved to be a very exciting series of sessions in the last couple of years. So those will be during the plenaries on Wednesday and Thursday. And then you'll also see the video that we've produced from the Storytime Domain interviews last year. I think that'll be in the first plenary session that you'll see that. Uh, we're hiring. There's a web developer ad out right now. Um, so if you know any former astronomers, web developers, anybody, um, please advertise this as broad as possible. Um, and then we'll also be putting out an ad for a designer within the next couple weeks, I think. Um, and so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. Did you hire a UX person? I remember you had a mm. search for that. Yeah, we did. We hired, um, we hired one developer in May who has settled into the team amazingly quickly. Um, and has really made some great progress. Uh, at the same time, we lost a developer who had the opportunity to go live in France for a year and not work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we gained a really great one, but we also lost one. And so now we're kind of, you know, I wouldn't say negative, but we are in need of developers. We are we're building content quicker than we can actually um, put it on online. So, and so I do have a question about the... I have a question about the formal education link. Um, yep. When you, the person that you would um, sponsor to work on um, the pipelines and you would get them to go to the project community workshop, the fellowship mm -hmm. that you indicated, um, do they have to be US based? Asking that for a friend, is... for real. That's <laughs> 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 um... I think my work. That's a really excellent question, um, and 
I think I'm going to have to say right now that the answer is yes, but I will look into that over the next month. So by the time we make the announcement, I'll see what the official project status is on what I can um, support with the NSF funds. Thank you. If anybody has any more questions, please feel free to just ask them. Yeah, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. This is this is Chad. Sorry. Sorry. I for the first 15 minutes I was walking through an airport and now I'm driving back to campus <laughs> so I can hear better. But um, thank you very much. I, I know for that your I. Um, I know that I mentioned this issue, I think, to you last year, but and I haven't had a chance to follow up, although I did find somebody who was interested in taking this on within the ISSC, and that is the potential of, when you talk about 101 level materials, I immediately think of STAT 101 materials. I think that using LSST data would make for a lot of very interesting uh, examples to incorporate into um, you know, intro stat courses, intro data science courses, machine learning courses. Um, so I, I would really like to pursue something like that. Is that something that you would be interested in? Um, I think so. I mean, I think certainly having these things, having a large data set like this accessible to, to those fields makes a lot of sense. Um, I'd definitely be interested in hearing a little bit more about um, what you mean in terms of like creating a separate investigation that isn't, well, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in, in talking to you a little bit more about what that means and kind of what it, what it would um, require from my team versus what we would support for you to develop or. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I, fortunately, I, I have somebody, there, there's somebody within our department who's trained as an astronomer who, who's really interested in pursuing something like this. So I think he could take on a lot of the heavy lifting, but you know, I'm just thinking about if you have an intro machine learning course, you're talking about a classification method, you know, getting those examples in front of students. I, I think it'd be a great step to getting more people in those fields interested in astronomy. So it's definitely something I would, I'd like to uh, look into further. Um, yeah, I, sorry. that'd be great. <laughs> I heard my name within the first 15 minutes. I, I did hear that. So if there was, was there a question that I missed? I apologize. Uh, no, I was just asking if everybody could remind me what science collaboration they were involved in. <laughs> oh, okay. I filled in for you. Okay. All right. Uh, actually, All right. I wanted to, to follow up on what Chad mentioned, Amanda, and I, I had bugged Amanda a little while ago to see if um, I was considering including the EPO in um, the broader outreach of one of my proposals and working with her to include some universities, some local universities that are minority serving universities in the EPO testing days. And what I was talking about was very much along the lines of what Chad says, because when you think about these um, underrepresented minorities, it makes a lot more sense to educate them in skills that are applicable more broadly than just academic astronomy. Uh, or even just astronomy for the curiosity of it, it makes sense to leverage the database to teach them skills in data science and machine learning, which are extremely sellable um, mm -hmm. and very formative. So I think that that is a great idea, and I actually have been thinking about this for some time. So I really think the EPO need, that we should have a discussion about this um, and see how the EPO can um, can serve this, can can have this role as well. Um, also, I wanted to, to say that as I bring this up, I think um, it's a really good thing that you talk to us because I think we can make very strong cases in our proposals for the broader outreach if we work with you as, uh, you know, mm -hmm. being involved in LSST and knowing that LSST has so much attention on, um, on public outreach and education. And if we can fold any of the support that we give to you into our proposals as part of our broader outreach, I think it can be a win-win. I mean, it's always gonna be a win-win because it's great, but it can be a win-win where we actually get some grant money. So. Well, you know, I think that's a perfect, um, it's a perfect combination because we as the EPO team have made a decision um, because you have to make decisions somewhere. You can't do everything for everybody. <laughs> Um, we've made a decision based on what exists out there and what our, the strengths of our team are that we are not actually teaching coding. 
we are producing these interactive ways for not, you know, data science students to interact with LSST data, um, but as part of a grant that maybe some people who do have expertise in machine learning or another application for this want to um, put in, have that expertise and work on that development, then we can incorporate that into the infrastructure that we're building. I think that's a great marriage. Um, unfortunately, we've had to make we've had to make decisions so that we can produce things that are as high in quality as they can um, and not try to reach too broadly and then not have a, a high enough quality for all of those. So I don't have any machine learning people on my team. I don't have that knowledge on my team right now. And so that would be a great way to um, get in incorporation from, from the science communications in the ways that you guys are interested in. Excellent. Amanda had a question about brokers. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about, you know, what are the three most exciting things on the sky? I'm not sure there is three, only three exciting things on the sky um, per field per se, but have you started talking to brokers about ways that they might be able to help or the potential brokers, given we now know what the set of them are, given the notice, the letter of, of intent had to go in? Yep, absolutely. Lauren was present at the workshop that happened in Seattle a couple weeks ago, and so that was a really informative um, time for us to understand what brokers are doing at the moment. And what uh, I think the main conclusion she came with was that we're all kind of in alignment, <laughs> which is good. Uh, so kind of building some of those relationships out a little bit more and thinking more through the use cases of what we actually want to present. I agree with you, there's not only going to be three exciting things, but the public is not going to be able to digest 50 very exciting things. So it, we do need to be cognizant of what is most exciting for the public. And so we're going to have to make some cuts at some point, but we want um, you know, a scientist's view on, on how we might go about doing that the best. Thanks. One other question I have is, um... Just in general, um, it sounds like you use the project community workshop as a way to get a lot of feedback. My collaboration does not in, in large numbers go. So I'm just wondering if you have other suggestions of how to make that connection. Because for us, everyone's usually going to AAAS and DPS. So a third meeting on top of it until there's actually science, like funding, travel funding in place, means that a lot less people go to the project community workshop. Although it's good, it's just currently the state the state of things for my science collaboration. Do you have suggestions on how to sort of encourage people, or is it just that they need to send an email to you or to your deputy? Certainly people can send an email to me. Um, part of my reaching out is talking to you guys now, having these talks. Um, I'll send out an email at the end of the week that has a list of like asks, and I mean, I can specify what science collaboration, if somebody could volunteer to do very specific things that you can then communicate with people um, and they can reach out, which would be great. Um, a challenge for us has been how to, like I have a question about this kind of data. How do I find the right person who can do that? And I've I've sent out emails to, uh, folks before, but haven't really gotten very much response from from those kind of science collaboration chairs or going through Jelco or going through Fed. So um, I'd like to build up that relationship. I think now that I've got a very specific list of asks, I can go through the community.lsst.org forum as well and reach out that way. So those are two um, options. I think the community is also about, that's a bit of the problem. We have so many venues, like the Project Community Workshop, Community Slack, so it's, um, the, the attention is dispersed and each one of these venues is biased and has a subset of the people that are attending and participating. Um, from our point of view as science collaborations, because um, communication sometimes is difficult even within the science collaborations and because most of the science collaborations work on a non-funded basis. The most clarity in the question, like the, the most clear the question, the easier it is, say, for me to go to the right science collaboration chair and for the right science collaboration chair to go to the right person within their science collaboration that they think could have the answer and the time um, to give you an answer. And also we should probably establish maybe um, a specific line, I don't know if it's Slack channel or a mailing list, probably a mailing list at this point, um, where you can specifically address um, specific questions to the chairs 
um, or, or something that is a little bit less cumbersome than you emailing me or Jelko and then me emailing somebody else and then passing the yeah. ball down the line. But we can think about better ways to communicate. And then um, as far as AAS and DPS go, maybe we can put some thought into the AAS because LSST does attend the AAS. They have a town hall every year at AAS. Yeah. I know because I had to go back to AAS um, since I started working on the science collaborations uh, that I swore <laughs> I would never go to. Um, <laughs> So we can think about that as well. Yep. So the but, last two but that, 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 that helps. I've been. I, we always have somebody there, either the project. Um, I've been at the last two AASs. Lauren will be present at the Hawaii AAS. Yeah. So we can. And we can organize, organize like, them. yeah, even um, even informally. Because I mean, organizing some intercessions is incredibly hard work. But I don't know that that would help Megan specifically because the science. The solar system community tend to go to DPS more than WS. So now yet another Project, meeting. Projects right? going to DPS, EPSC this year. So there's there's the I guess they're calling it a splitter session, but that's a town hall. So who I don't know, I don't yeah. I don't know the agenda yet. There's not so a I don't lot know. of incentive for an EPO member to take time and money to go to DPS. So I'd much rather kind of reach out with very specific asks through an email or through community or something like that, I think at this point. And to right. be fair, I haven't really had that many specific ones very well defined yet. So I think we're finally coming up to that point where I can reach out and, <laughs> and ask some right, questions. Right. But if you do have something you wanna say, I think just sending slides along to whoever's giving this overview would be useful. Just mm, to get great. people thinking okay. about it for DPS. But yeah, I agree. I don't think I don't think anyone from EPO has to be there, but I think is getting a couple slides into whoever's giving the overview would be great. The other yeah, thing that's worked, I think, really well with data management is that we have a data management liaison. So when I want to bother someone, I bother Mario. And I get, you know, he, he's supposed to listen to me. <laughs> he might, well, you know, I'm going to volunteer uh, Lauren. We have a liaison to the science collaborations, and that's Lauren Corley's, which I haven't so advertised I, yet. So. so I think is if you're saying, and I don't know if, if doing all the science collaborations one person is is is, you know, that might be a lot, I don't know. But I think is if you introduce it that way and say, this is the EPO liaison, she's gonna be emailing you, this is the person you email, right? Then it's a more personal con connection to the chair. And I, if, you know, if, if you find that we're not responding, maybe we need to have the, also the EPO connected point in, in our science collaboration, which is that this is the person that, you know, the EPO liaison emails. Right or contact, so maybe human to human is yeah. better. Um, I did so try I, I to think set those up maybe in the last yeah. year. I think maybe three science collaborations offered a liaison, um, and we had kind of hit and miss communication with those individuals. So we can try to set that up again. Right. So there's two things, right? So Megan is talking about a liaison within EPO that will liaison with each science collaboration. I don't think the EPO team is large enough to have individual we don't. It people would be one with a different science collaboration. So I think it would be yes. Lauren that will serve as the point of contact between the EPO and all of the science collaborations. Uh, but then we can also consider a liaison within the science collaborations to the EPO, and that would be a different person for each one of those. Frankly, my, it's, we're, for some of the science collaboration, that is also a difficult thing to, to generate because they're smaller and they're sort of less active right now, et cetera. We had, I went through whoops of fire to get this, this science collaborations to generate a role for uh, commissioning liaison, and that mm. is very timely. So I think right now the three or four that you got might be all that you're going to get at this point, given the lead time yeah. to actually LSST start up, the overload of things to do, and the size and activity of each science collaboration. Well, but this again, is part of the reason, this is part of the reason why we've initiated these small grants, so that we can try to get someone with domain expertise, with dedicated, like they're getting credit for the work. It's not just a volunteer thing that they have to fit into everything else. Right. So they're getting credit, they're getting some funding, and they have the expertise within the solar system or whatever the area is that we need, and we have their attention for six months. So that's kind of why we've initiated that. Right. But that's, that's and, just to clarify, that's just to build pipelines, right? So if you wanted someone consulting, 
that's different than what this grant will be. So the grants for, I'm going to write that to use open orb that'll compute you X, Y, Z positions of comments. Is that correct? Just to clarify, in my sense it was for coding parts of EPO, these EPO projects. Um, well, they haven't all fully been defined yet, so they might cover quite a range. I just kind of came up with an example or two <laughs> for purposes of today. Okay, thanks. Um, I think that where you didn't, just to be very practical, I think where you did not get a liaison um, offer by a science collaboration, just default back to the science collaboration chair as your point of contact. It probably indicates that the science collaboration is small enough and inactive enough that the role, that they just don't, don't need to split the role, that like there's not enough work that they need to like delegate the roles so um, so distinctly. So just default to the science collaboration chair. And when you do contact them, include me as well so that I can try and make <laughs> sure that I that uh, you know that people are paying attention and things like that. I think it's a job. Okay. Thank you very much. But this was an outstanding and um, and very, very impressive, I think. Oh, great. As my personal opinion. Um, yes, so thank I you. Would, I would distribute the, um, the recording to the rest of the chairs. We had four, maybe at some point, five, but definitely four science collaborations represented. Um, I will distribute the slides and the recording to the rest of the SCs. And then the slide at the end where you have the questions, I will copy them on Slack. We'll copy the content on Slack. But I also want to say, um, let's figure out, let's, let, let's indeed open a community um, board uh, where we talk about these things. I know that this will, okay, cut out, will effectively cut out some of the science collaborations that just don't hang out on community. Um, okay. But it, but well, and I'll a, put together a succinct list the of the questions and, yeah. um, you know, consulting things that we have at the moment, and then we can yes. use that as the basis to kind of start this communication. Yes. And if possible, if you've got like two or three sentences of like who Lauren is, what she's supposed to be doing, I can send that out to my science collaboration. We have a monthly newsletter, but I'll just write like I have it now in my Trello to be like. Here's, our, here's the EPO liaison if you've got any questions, but I think if you've got yeah. like what that role should mean, then like if you, if you can send that out to all the science collaboration chairs, we can forward that to try to get that information out of like, if you have ideas and you're interested or like this is this person, you should start talking yeah. to them. Great, certainly will. Thanks. Okay, I have to